So we've got some people from Cambridge, India, Toronto. Uh, this is great. Um, welcome everybody to this uh, to this uh, webinar. Thank you, Vishal, for being with us today. Um, we'd like to start first with a short uh, presentation of the uh, of uh, who we are. Um, so here at Association Quantum, our mission is supporting the quantum tech community, spreading uh, quantum knowledge, inspiring communities to adopt quantum technologies for a better tomorrow. Uh, today's webinar will focus on uh, financial technology applications of quantum computing. Vishal uh, will be presenting his, um, his company and uh, his work in the sphere. Um, Quantum technologies have the potential to dramatically transform numerous industries, including financial services. Uh, today, we'll ex examine the potential impact of short, medium, and the long term uh, across all parts of financial services, including retail, corporate banking, asset management, and investment banking. Michelle will then uh, exam examine some of the specific use cases that are possible with today's technology what you can do to generate value from early stage quantum technology today, and how you can prepare to be a winner in the quantum revolution. Specifically for our speaker today, Vishal, thank you for being with us. Vishal leads the quantum commercialization practice at SIA Partners. They create value by solving some of the world's toughest challenges with disruptive technologies such as quantum, quantum inspired solution. They help leading co corporates especially the ones in financial uh, services and, and healthcare, though I've heard that you also deal with a plethora of industries such as uh, energy, uh, to understand the possibility to develop strategies and generate value from adopting quantum technologies. They also uh, help uh, the world's premier technology firms understanding the, the, the most valuable problem they need to be addressing with their in-house IP in quantum. They are developing commercially viable businesses through, apply, through applying near-term quantum technology in financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, and energy. Welcome, Vishal. Uh, the floor is yours. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Remy, uh, for, for that kind introduction. So, and thank you, everyone. Good afternoon to all of you in, uh, in the European side of the world. Uh, good morning, or Good early afternoon for those in the United States and, uh, and, and, and North America, and uh, good evening for those joining in from Asia. So um, as, as uh, Remy had said today, I think uh, it, it's a very exciting topic we'll be covering. We'll be covering kind of um, value of quantum and financial services, what's possible today uh, in the short term, in, in the medium term, and in the long term. So in order to cover that off, um, I have just uh, started sharing uh, my screen on my presentation. Remy, can you just confirm you can see uh, the screen fine? Uh, yes, we can see your screen, the PowerPoint. It's not in presentation mode at the moment. Okay, it should be getting into presentation mode shortly. Um, great. Um, as, yeah, I think it should be getting into presentation mode and you should be able to see that um, shortly. But um, just in terms of what we're covering today, so just conscious that we've got an hour and a half um, allocated for this session. Um, we may not take up the whole hour and a half, uh, but if there's a robust discussion, we may well do. Um, so, but the plan is to give this presentation for about 45 minutes or so, uh, maybe stop for uh, questions along the way and have a proper Q&A discussion towards the end. Um, so what I'd like to do firstly is give an overview of SEER Partners and the quantum ecosystem, who we are, what we do in this space. Um, so uh, why we have um, some experience and knowledge and credibility in terms of talking about applications of quantum uh, and related technologies in, in financial services. Um, so this talk is uh, targeted at, at two different types of profiles. Uh, it, it's targeted at those um, with a kind of you know, quantum background or quantum interest, uh, but it's also targeted at those who are, are sort of new uh, to the space and those with more maybe a financial services background. So, uh, a very quick introduction into what is quantum and why you should care, why it's interesting uh, and why it's exciting. Uh, and then we'll move on to what are the types of opportunities within financial services? Um, what, are, what are the opportunities as, as we were saying before today and in the future? 
um, and how quantum technologies are better at addressing these opportunities as opposed to classical computing uh, technologies of today. Uh, and then we'll move on to a, a particular real-world application that we want to dive into, get, get our teeth into, uh, which is in, in reverse stress testing. So we want to go into a particular challenge of reverse stress testing, pretty big challenge um, that exists in the industry today, and how quantum technologies would be able to help. Um, and then finally, just uh, would like to give an overview of how, uh, if you and your organization wanted to get started on the quantum journey, how you could get started, what steps you should be taking, and, uh, and, and what principles you should be adhering to um, along the way. And as I said, there's some time for Q&A towards the end. Um, again, if you guys would like to get in touch with me, I'm more than happy to have a conversation. Um, either uh, find me on LinkedIn. I think I'll, I'll post my LinkedIn into the chat and things, uh, or, or it should be on the Association Quantum um, uh, LinkedIn in page as well, or, or send me an email, um, vishal.chete at cfpartners, uh, partnerscom Right, so uh, diving into things about CA Partners. Um, we're a management consulting firm focused um, on disruptive innovation. And more particularly, we help the world's kind of more, most ambitious companies innovate and disrupt their markets. And often it's through leveraging new trends and technologies. So we work across sectors um, and uh, we feel that working across sectors gives us unique perspective. Um, so within CA Partners, um, I lead the quantum commercialization practice. And in terms of quantum commercialization, um, CA Partners is, I think, in a pretty unique position. So Sorry, we Michelle. sit- Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, I still see uh, your first slide. Oh, You're not in presentation right. mode. Right, 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 right. Um, so I will, thanks for um, mentioning that. What I might do is, um, I might try sharing my screen one more time. If not, I will. Uh... Great. Can you guys see that? Right now, only your. Uh... Ah, yes. Yes. That's great. It works. Thank you. Okay. Excellent. Um, yes. So as I was saying, um, say partners as a consulting firm is is uniquely positioned. We're positioned between uh, technology firms and corporates. Um, so what we do is in, in the quantum commercialization practice, what we do is we work with technology firms. So the leading kind of quantum computing companies of today uh, to help them identify what are the most impactful and valuable corporate problems they need to be addressing using that technology. So all this technology is great, but why does it matter? What difference does it make? How valuable is it for whom? And how much are they willing to you know, how urgent is that problem? How much are they willing to pay for it? How much are they willing to invest in the long term for it? Um, we also help the technology firms interpret these problems in a way that match to their technologies, right? So we help them um, see what the problem is at a high level. Uh, and then we help them kind of interpret, you know, what that means in terms of the quantum hardware or software that they're working with. And then uh, conversely, on, on the corporate side, we help uh, corporates demystify uh, quantum technologies. We help corporates understand, you know, what is quantum computing? What is this new incredible thing that's coming about? How is it relevant for me and my business? Uh, what should I be doing? Where should I be paying attention? And who should, I, who should I be working with? And very, very importantly, what is the business case behind investing in this technology in the, in the medium, medium and long term, right? So is it just money down, um, you know, a wishing well? Or, or is there a tangible business case that we can uh, adhere to, and which is what which is what we help um, develop these organizations. Um, give me one second to having some issues with the slide. There we go. Yeah. Um, so just quickly, uh, so in terms of the organizations that we work with, here's just a snapshot of some of the organizations who've been. Uh, engaging with in terms of uh, problems that they face that could potentially be resolved by quantum technologies um, in the future, but also some of the things they can do today to create value from this. Um, main point here is to show kind of breadth of, of contact and uh, the, the, um, the variety of people we've been uh, getting in touch with. Obviously, a lot in financial services, which is the focus of, of today's um, session. And on the technology side, as I said, we work with uh, some of the leading technology firms uh, in, in the quantum landscape. 
Microsoft Fujitsu, Rigetti, Byte, um, and obviously there's one more which which I can't name yet, but it's a uh, trap tie technology, which is which is very exciting. So um, we help these organizations understand how that technology can be used to solve some of the problems that the corporates are facing. So um, in terms of, uh, very quickly before we, we dive into, into the full, full detail of things, um, in terms of um, the actual projects that we're doing, in terms of commercially valid businesses that we're bringing to life, right? Um, so using quantum inspired technologies, uh, and I'll come back to how quantum inspired technology is fitting within the landscape, uh, but using quantum inspired technologies, we've been um, developing, building commercially viable businesses across various industries in drug discovery and steel manufacturing, oil and gas, financial services, and energy, right? So this is not, um, you know, these, these are projects to take these things into production. Uh, this is not a, a proof of concept only, or this is not a, a toy problem for the future. Um, this is kind of helping these organizations create value uh, using quantum inspired technologies today. Um, and we'll be going into um, much more detail on the financial services side um, in, in, the, in this presentation. Uh, but I should also say at this point, um, you know, along with the association quantum team, we'll be doing a webinar on the 9th of July. Uh, so CA Partners will be doing a webinar on the 9th of July about quantum uh, value, about how you can create value through quantum technologies across all industries. Um, and um, you'll be able to see the link come through from the association quantum guys and, uh, and, and from um, myself and our team on, on LinkedIn as well. Great. Um, so quick intro into quantum computing, mainly for those that are not um, super familiar with the concept. I won't delve on it too long because I realize there might be many that are, you know, potentially even experts in this space. Um, one thing, one caveat to put into place before, before I dive into this. Um, so our expertise, as I talked about before, is really in understanding industry problems and understanding how quantum technologies today and the future can resolve these. We're not, um, you know, the, the deep technical understanding of it is, uh, is not, you know, we, we do understand quantum technologies to, to a deep enough level to enable us to solve problems, right? But uh, we're not, you know, deep core technologies by, uh, by that perspective. Um, but very quickly, just a, a high level helicopter level introduction into what is quantum computing for those that, that may be interested. Um, so, Classical computing, in classical computing, uh, a computer runs uh, based on these building blocks of discrete numbers, which is zeros or ones, right? Um, it's de 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 deterministic and repeated computations. So the same input will give you the same output. Uh, each each um, bit of information is always either zero or one. Um, in quantum computing, the paradigm is quite different, right? So a quantum computer runs on quantum bits or qubits um, that actually have an infinite number of possible states. Um, and they can be zero or one or in, in, um, in any state in between. Um, a lot of people that are not close to the quantum uh, world ask me sometimes why we have got a cat in the presentation. Uh, I think it's uh, you know, worth mentioning. It's, it's a, a acknowledgement to Schrodinger's cat because um, you know, when, uh, when, when a qubit uh, is in superposition, it can be in zero and one at the same time, right? So, a qubit can be in multiple states uh, at the same time and can be in zero and one at the same time. So the way I like to think about it um, is, is using an analogy of um, a coin spinning on a table. Um, and just another caveat, I'll be using a few analogies as we go through uh, this presentation. Hopefully it helps bring some of this stuff to life. Um, so going back to superposition, so we think of superposition as a coin spinning on a table. Uh, while it's spinning on the table, uh, you don't know if it's a heads or a tails. When it lands, you can tell if it's a heads or a tails, right? So while it's spinning on a table, it can be thought of as being, you know, in superposition. It can't heads and tails both at the same time because it's spinning. Um, so that that's the superposition um, side of it, and then there's the entanglement side of it, which is another a very interesting concept um, of 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 uh, within quantum computing, which is um, multiple qubits are often connected to each other and influenced with each other, right? So uh, they don't have to be physically connected to each other, but they can be influenced, they can influence each other, right? So, which is uh, quite a spooky concept and, and we'll go into more detail as to why, uh, why that comes about um, in the future. Um, so, 
I will, what I, I re realize there's some questions being asked. So what I might do is I'll run through kind of the first kind of section of this, which is a, a sort of a brief intro into quantum and related technologies. Uh, and then I'll, I'll stop for questions there. Um, and then, and then we'll go into kind of more of the financial services meet to fit, and then we'll come back to uh, a full, full Q and A at the end of that. Um, so just moving on in terms of uh, how information is processed, um, as you're saying, information is entangled together. So uh, qubits are entangled together. So one qubit influences the state of others, regardless of the physical distance. Um, and the quantum computers allow them to in intrinsically converge on, on the right. right? Uh, and that's different from, quantum, from um, classical computing because uh, information is processed sequentially. So um, it's kind of like if you're um, reading a book. So in, in classical computing, if you read a book, uh, and you read one page, you read the next page, you read the page after, and so on. So as you go through, you, you sequentially understand more and more of the book. Uh, whereas that's not how a quantum um, computing system works, because if you did that, you know, the, the, it wouldn't, the, the answers wouldn't make any sense. Um, so instead, it, when, when the way quantum computing works is that it, rather than reading each book at a time, it's kind of the whole, informa whole book's information is converged all at once and then visible all at once. Uh, which again is a very new and interesting concept, right? So after that brief detour into into a layman's intro uh, into into quantum, um, I'll just kind of summarizing the the key things that I'd said. So different paradigm uh, from zeros and ones and so on. Uh, key things to keep in keep in mind: super zip, superposition, so it allows you to be in multiple states at the same time. Entanglement, and one more thing, which is tunneling. Uh, which is allows you to find the theoretical maximum or theoretical minimum in a problem space. I'll come into more detail into this as, as we go through. Um, quantum computing uh, still has as, as many challenges um, with, uh, with regards to you know, being stable and with regards to being scalable. Um, they can be summarized in terms of decoherence, noise, and, and errors. Uh, and in particular, um, noise is... Uh, so in particular, noise is when a system, a quantum system, it's very sensitive to any ambient noise that happens around it, uh, and that causes disturbance of the whole system. And fault tolerance and error correction are a massive um, challenge for, for quantum uh, computing uh, companies of today. And, and being able to address this is one of the biggest barriers in scalable, true quantum computing, right? Now, um, now having, having kind of done that intro, um, I'd like to talk about a, a bit more detail about you know, the range of technologies that exist within the quantum landscape as per, as per our point of view, right? Um, so I think a lot of people talk about the three eras of quantum computing. So noisy intermediate scale quantum, quantum advantage, and then full scale fault tolerance. Um, and you know, really people um, you know, using, using that paradigm uh, people think that um, since until we get to quantum advantage, you can't really have superior performance over classical computing. Um, and a lot of people think quantum advantage is about five years away, um, maybe more five to 10 years away. Now, the other part that we, you know, we'd like to bring to the table, the other picture that we, we bring to the table in terms of how we see the landscape at say partners is uh, we have, we see quantum inspired and simulations as, as a big part of, of this entire landscape, right? Um, so these are hardware and software techniques uh, that enable, that are inspired by the, uh, the concepts of quantum and quantum computing um, that really enable a polynomial speed up, uh, so an exponential improvement in solving certain types of problems uh, that, that's significantly better than what classical computing can offer, right? So just to repeat that, quantum inspired and, uh, and, and simulations can solve certain types of problems significantly better than what classical computing can. Uh, and this is available today, which is, which is quite exciting, right? Um, so in this landscape, we see, um, you know, we see a whole range of players. So in, in terms of you know, where we can unlock value today, uh, as I was talking about quantum inspired and near-term quantum, so we've got the digital annealing solutions and simulators. So Fujitsu uh, have got a quantum inspired digital annealer. Uh, Hitachi have got a very similar, um, very similar thing. And Toshiba and Microsoft have quantum inspired, um, quantum inspired solutions as well, which enable um, significant speed up over what's possible in, in classical computing. 
each each of these um, each of these players have got different uh, capabilities, and each of these players have got different uh, strengths. But the the magic is 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 I think that you know using these technologies on the left, we think we can create real value today uh, and start a lot of organizations on the quantum journey. And then the quantum journey, as we said, uh, you know goes into NISC, and then uh, and and NISC really is is great because it improves the technology, it improves what's possible, but it can't solve you know real problems today because of the limitations and problem size and limitations in error correction as we were talking about before. And then and then on the on the right hand side of the paradigm you've got true quantum. So quantum annealing I think is is a bit closer to that stage. Uh, and I think a lot of people have heard about D-Wave and, and, and the work that they're doing. Um, and, and then there's there's true quantum which is like superconducting tracked ion and photons and so on. Um, so and, and that's still really um, in, in very much in the development phase, not really ready for production level um, deployment or production level scale scale today. Right, so why is all this important and why should we care, right? Like, so what's, what's all this quantum stuff about? Like, why, why do people, you know, why does it matter? So quantum technologies enable an exponential speed up uh, in, in solving certain types of problems, right? So, which means for certain problem types, they're 10,000 times faster than the most powerful supercomputer of today or tomorrow, right? Um, so that for certain problem types, it's just so much faster that you wouldn't even believe. But it's not just the speed that makes it different, right? Um, with quantum technologies, you're also able to solve that uh, people, you know, people solve the certain types of problems that people realize they had, uh, but they found too difficult to resolve. You know, certain types of problems where they, they may exist, organizations know they exist, but um, they just don't you know, bother with solving it because they think it's impossible to solve. Um, and then finally, there's a third class of problems, there's problems that people haven't even imagined today, right? Like, so problems that exist, um, but people haven't even thought about uh, you know, um, addressing. So a simple analogy um, that we use to bring some of this stuff to life, right? Um, again, for for the purists, the analogies might not be perfect, but I think you know, I think um, it's it's really important for those you know for those without quantum physics PhDs or those without uh, an academic or deep technical experience to uh, start to understand the power of this. So, in in many ways, um, comparing classical computing to to quantum computing is comp is like comparing a bicycle to a jet plane, right? Um, a jet plane won't do all use cases. A jet plane won't be useful for everywhere. Like if you need to just go to the corner shop and get some milk, uh, a bicycle is probably going to be better today and better forever, right? To, to go to the corner shop and get that. Now, but if you have a jet plane, it allows you to do things you can't even imagine if you just have a bicycle in front of you. You know, allows you to go to different countries, allows you to visit the world, opens up literally a whole new world of possibilities, right? So it's just such a fundamental paradigm shift that it, it's, it's like comparing something quite simple like a bicycle to a jet plane. Um, and then uh, again, just recapping the problem types that you can, uh, that, that this allows us to, to address. Problems you can just about solve today, but non-optimally, so people don't find the best solution, just do a, uh, do a best guess uh, approach. Problem, problems that they wish they could solve, um, but uh, you know, but, but wish they could solve, but they don't know they can't given the current limitations and problems they don't even know they could solve. So problems they didn't even know exist um, or challenges or opportunities they didn't even know exist. So um, just before I dive into for, dive further into, uh, into the presentation, I thought might, this might be a good time to do a quick check-in. I know someone had raised their hand, um, so someone had raised their hand i know someone had um, currently uh the questions uh that have been answered uh, sorry the questions that have been asked they've been answered uh privately uh okay. there was one question about the youtube i do have one small um question you mentioned the the fact that uh this can allow for a uh, huge speed gain but you also you also talked about the fact that uh, quantum computing works on a whole different plane 
and I was wondering, are we just talking about the fact that we are having three states instead of two, or is there something else that is being used to to justify that ten thousand fold gain that we were talking about? Um, so no, it, it's it's essentially you know solving problems. Um, you know, regardless of which approach you use, it's solving problems exponentially quicker. So it, it is a different paradigm. It's a different way of addressing it. Uh, but it is solving problems exponentially quicker and better, right? Um, so, yeah, um, even with quantum-inspired technologies that exist today, uh, you can solve some problem types, not everything, but some problem types exponentially better than possible with, with classical computing. Um, and as, as we go through the stages of you know, the NISC era, as we move into quantum advantage uh, and to full state, uh, full state quantum computing, um, the types of problems you can solve just you know ex become become um, bigger and bigger, and as in the types of problems you can solve uh, increase exponentially. Well, that's interesting. It's not only the the difficulty of the problem, uh, but it's also the type of problems that you can address. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Very well. Great. Um, um, sorry. Go I, I'll let you. Uh, there are no other questions, so I'll let you go on. Okay. Great. So moving on through to the next bit, which is, um, okay. So the types of problems. So this is kind of, uh, you know, going into some of the stuff that we talked about, um, that we were talking about before, you know, they're the types of problems that are suitable for the jet plane of, of quantum computing um, can pre pretty much be characterized in, in these four things, right? Optimization, simulation, machine learning, and cryptography. Um, optimization problems are essentially, you know, again, I'm going to give a brief intro into, into these for those that are not familiar. Um, optimization problems are, are essentially those with uh, where, where there's a exponential number of uh, potential variables and exponential number of potential options. Uh, and given a set of constraints, you want to find the best combination, right? Um, and a, a very common, um, a very common uh, view of this is the traveling salesman problem, uh, where if a person needs to go to 20 different cities or 20 different um, houses, uh, what is the best way to go through those 20 houses in which order such that you travel the least distance? Traveling salesman problem, very common, right? Um, that is, you know, just a simple example like that. Uh, you would have a few billion potential combinations in which you can traverse those 20 cities or 20 houses, right? So it's quite a big complex. Uh, it becomes to be it becomes big complex problems very quickly. Um, simulation is is another big one. So simulation is uh, you know sampling based simulations. So quantum computing uh, can enable sampling based simulations. So these are already done today using Monte Carlo type systems. Uh, but quantum sampling can allow uh, essentially the characteristics of a complex system to be determined through much fewer samples than possible with Monte Carlo. Right, so it's quite exciting when you start thinking about applications in financial services, uh, because you know Monte Carlo is used very wide, very very widely in financial services. So if you can improve um, simulation and sampling um, off of Monte Carlo, that that starts to become very exciting. And then a little bit more in the longer term, there's machine learning and cryptography, right? Which is um, which is I mean, we what we all know about machine learning, but quantum enabled machine learning can uh, enable data, enable um, machine learning models to be uh, trained through sort of much quicker and faster uh, and, and it, because it'll enable them to process data much quicker and faster, but also will enable these models to be trained with less data because of how it can tweak the um, generalization parameters that, it, that, that you have. And cryptography, I think, is, is quite an uh, important one to consider as well because the potential for quantum to have an impact on prime number factoring uh, and uh, enable much faster prime number factoring, which is, which is basically the basis on which all cryptography happens. So, you know, classical computing cryptography will be essentially, um, you know, unviable uh, if quantum computing were to exist in its full state. Quite an interesting paradigm. So given these four problem types, we've looked at then where do these four problem types fit within the financial services landscape, right? 
Um, so within the financial services landscape, we've looked at you know, uh, retail banking, capital markets, and asset management. And within that, where do these problem types really, really fit in, right? Um, so starting with the optimization, um, or the optimization angle. Again, optimization is a problem that can be solved with some quantum inspired type technologies. Uh, some optimization problems can be solved, solved with quantum uh, inspired type technologies. So they could be, you know, they could be quite interesting. So what, what are some of the optimization problems um, in, across, across the financial services landscape? So um, starting with the retail banking side, right? Portfolio optimization is one that's, that's quite uh, interesting. You know, when you, when you look at um, quantum computing and financial services, portfolio optimization is probably the first one that, uh, that pops up as a, as a use case. Um, and it is quite interesting and it is quite, quite mature in, in some ways because, um, you know, some of, the, some of the players we've been talking to have been developing solutions to this space um, for, for a while. Um, and what is port portfolio optimization in retail banking? So an example of that is, you know, if you look at a, a treasury portfolio that, that exists in a retail bank. So um, each, uh, the treasury of, of a retail bank is, is required to keep a buffer of high quality liquid assets. So you're required to keep a buffer of assets in case anything should go wrong, uh, in case there should be a big, um, you know, disruption to your bank. You will have uh, you will have a buffer so that you don't you don't go out of business essentially, right? There are only certain types of assets that are that are um, allowed to be within the high quality liquid assets buffer. Uh, there are about a thousand or so uh, assets, and they're they're in different categories, but a thousand or so different types of assets. Now, um, the the challenge is that which of these thousand assets do you pick such that you have the maximum return from this portfolio for the lowest risk? Um, so the return of each of these assets can, can be looked at in two ways. Either you look at for a fixed income um, type assets or a bond or, or anything along those lines, you've got the cash flow projections. Uh, but in, in, an equity, uh, you need to, in an equity space, you need to use the CAPM model and return, return forecasting becomes a bit more complex in that perspective. Um, and, and the risk then is essentially typically, well, in financial services, the risk is always looked at um, through, through the lens of volatility, right? So you look, at, um, you look at the correlation and the volatility of each of these assets individually, but the correlation and the volatility of these assets together. Uh, and then you want to decide which of these should you include in your basket of high quality liquid assets, such that you know, not only will you have the, the appropriate level of risk, um, but also you will have um, the best return possible. Um, now, um, that, that's, with, that's with portfolio optimization from that perspective, right? Like, and, and you know, just to give people a feel, um, so a, a, a mid-sized bank, a mid-sized European retail bank has about 100 billion, 150 billion um, euros in, uh, in, in this high quality liquid assets buffer. So even, uh, you know, 10, 20, 50 basis point improvements or 10, 20, so 0.5% improvement in the returns of these, um, of these assets, which is very much possible with the models we're looking at, creates you know, exponential returns, creates quite a big, quite a big return. Um, again, there, there, there are other optimization um, uh, challenges for, for retail banks, such as you know, optimizing, optimizing the branch network. So where do you have, where's the optimal place to have, uh, to have branches out in, in the street? Um, given your closing, you know, many branches down. This is pre-COVID days, so uh, it's a bit different with <laughs> with a COVID lens. Structured product development and design, and so on. Uh, and again, in capital markets, um, similar uh, similar challenges uh, or similar opportunities exist in in portfolio optimization. But you know, when I talked about the high quality liquid assets buffer, that's just one. You know, many many different. There are many many different types of portfolios that exist across. Uh, all of capital markets, um, and many of these, um, you know, can be optimized again to to uh, the unlocking of significant gain uh, from that perspective. Um, another one in capital markets that's interesting to look at is is collateral optimization. Um, so collateral optimization is essentially when um, you know across across a bank across many trading desks put together, uh, when you make a trade, quite often you need to post some collateral for that trade. So you need to, uh, you, you're obliged to post either some cash or uh, some certain types of securities 
<clears throat> should you not be able to meet your obligations for that trade, right? Um, the optimization around that is, is that, you know, there are many, many different, um, many, many different obligations across your entire institution. So across your bank, across your trade, across your multiple trading desks, there are many different obligations. Um, some trades allow you to post cash plus equities plus, uh, plus government bonds plus et cetera, et cetera. And some only allow you to post cash and equities and so on. And certain assets are more expensive to hold, certain assets are cheaper to hold. So in collateral optimization, what you want to do is find the combination of those such that as a whole, you're spending the least on, on, on putting up this collateral, right? So that's, that's quite an interesting one for, um, for capital markets and quite an interesting one uh, to, to unlock value. Again, trade netting and settlement as well is, is an interesting one. So um, I won't dive into too much more with the optimization problems. I hope that's given uh, people a flavor uh, of, of um, what's possible in this space. Um, just uh, moving through into just, uh, yeah, here we go. So moving through into simulation. So simulation is uh, again super interesting one. Um, as, as I was saying a few minutes ago, um, quantum quantum sampling and quantum simulation can allow you to, you know, can allow you to, to determine the characteristics of a complex system with less samples than possible with uh, Monte Carlo, right? And Monte Carlo is applied again very, very broadly through uh, through through financial services. So, um, you know, two two areas which are super interesting um, are, are you know in in assets asset pricing, so in assets or option pricing. So, which could be a very, very exciting area uh, as the solutions around this mature. Um, and reverse stress testing. Um, and, and reverse stress testing is one which we'll get into uh, more detail on, on later in the presentation. But it's essentially um, a problem that exists across many types of institutions um, and one that's, that can be solved much better with, uh, with, with quantum technologies. Um, machine learning then. So machine learning, we've got, um, again, machine learning, I should say, across all these use cases, this is, you know, just a very small subset of what's possible. Uh, there are many, many more use cases for quantum technologies all the way through. Uh, machine learning, again, can be applied across many parts of financial services, you know, including, say, in market forecasting, in, in the capital market space, uh, which is being applied today in, mar in market forecasting. And if you can improve the, the models that you use for that, it's, it's again, uh, quite an exciting space to be. Um, and then with cryptography, we've got, um, again, a challenge, uh, both a challenge and an, and an opportunity. Um, so with, uh, with the, the challenge is that, um, you know, current security levels will need to be uh, addressed and current security will need to be reviewed. Um, um, but it, the, the opportunity is that it enables, uh, enables kind of quantum uh, secured communication. So communication based on the principles of quantum entanglement. Uh, which is which is quite exciting, uh, and quantum distributed ledgers. So again, distributed ledgers based on the principles of uh, of entanglement, uh, which which again can be can be quite exciting. Again, distributed ledgers is something that's that's applied across uh, across different parts of, of the industry, and interesting to to see what we can do in that space. Right. Um, so just before I move on to um, move on to the next bit, which is kind of diving in, into a little bit more detail in optimization and simulation. Um, any any questions uh, from from the group on uh, some of the use cases that I just presented? There there was a question about um, cryptography, which. Um, I'm going to read out for you. Given nearly every organization is moving to post quantum encryption and away from RSA and Diffie Hellman, does the cryptographic application really exist? So I think the cryptography application um, does exist in the sense that, um, you know, there's, there's applications, um, you know, as, as I was talking about, in, I mean, cryptography and communication kind of in, in our view kind of comes together. So, um, it exists from that perspective in terms of quantum secured communication, quantum cryptography from, from that perspective. 
and with quantum distributed ledgers. But as you can see, kind of from the maturity scale, um, we don't see that as, as a near-term thing. We see that as a very, fairly kind of medium to long-term thing. Yeah, it seems like all the cryptography potential is still locked in into either hardware or software uh, yeah. development. Yeah, and I think uh, Marika has just asked a question around what's closest to market and what is needed to, to get into quantum computing. So very good question there. So closest to market really is the stuff on the right, right? The stuff on the right, um, which, uh, you know, around portfolio optimization, around stress testing, around trade netting and settlement, collateral optimization, these ones are, are close to market. In fact, you know, we're working to, to bring some of these into production today using quantum inspired technologies, right? Like, so it's, you don't have to wait years until uh, some of this stuff starts to come to life and develop some of this stuff today and you can you can realize and unlock some of this value today very well so do you use any distributed quantum computing frameworks we use any uh, distributed quantum computing frameworks um no we don't really use um distributed quantum computing frameworks um yeah, no, we, we haven't really come across those um, as yet. Um, but it could be interesting to, to look into. Very well. Cool. Um, great. I think moving on to uh, moving on to the next piece. Again, some of this, uh, the next bit is, is I think, um, for me, super important in terms of understanding, you know, the concept of why optimization is different and why it's uh, why it's relevant. Let me just get, uh, yeah, here we go. Here we go. Um, so why are quantum technologies superior at solving optimization problems, right? Um, so we just, we just went through a few examples of, you know, optimization problems in, in financial services. You know, obviously they exist across other industries as well, and we're looking to address them across indus other industries as well. Um, so, uh, so we've got, we've got uh, a simple analogy here that kind of brings some of this stuff to life, right? Um, so imagine you're in a mountainous landscape, so many mountains, hills, and valleys, and your, your uh, objective is to find the lowest point in the landscape, so the deepest valley in that space, right? Um, as a human, you would you know, literally have to physically walk around the entire landscape and, and find the deepest and the deepest valley, right? Like, so the, this is a, an analogy to, ex, to, to um, bring to life kind of different solutions that might exist. So imagine in a problem, there's a whole range of solutions and you want to find the solution with the deepest answer, like with the lowest answer, the global minimum as, uh, as, some, as some might call it, right? So a human again has to walk around and it's very inefficient to find it. You know, typical classical brute force, uh, you know, computing, will definitively find you the, the, the best answer, uh, but that will take, you know, potentially a, a really long time to go through, you know, the entire landscape and find kind of what the, what the, uh, what the best answer is, what the global minimum is. Um, so to, to mitigate that, a lot of people today use heuristics and AI, which you can see in the bottom left over there, right? So heuristics and AI essentially look at, you know, making a prediction. So predicting based on, are there previous landscapes like this? What does this landscape look like? Or based on some characteristics of this landscape, where do I think the likely hotspot is in terms of the lowest, uh, the lowest position or in terms of the, the global minimum? Um, that's, again, that's a, good, that's a good analogy and that's great that it works in some cases, uh, but in many cases, it doesn't definitively give you the best answer because you're stuck in what's called a local minimum. So you might think you're at the lowest point in the valley, uh, but the lowest point in the valley might be all the way on the other side of the valley, and you're just looking at this side of the valley because uh, because your your heuristics and AI are focused on on that space, right? Um, so you you don't get to the the globally the best answer. Um, and you know really that's 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 a that's a concept that's used a lot today. Now, but one and and it's great in many cases. Uh, but one thing to remember is that this concept doesn't really work uh, and it kind of falls apart when the future doesn't represent the past, right? 
So in financial services, in many instances, the future does not represent the past. This landscape is not like previous landscapes, right? So the market of today is not like the market of yesterday or uh, the potential optimization on your portfolio is, is different from what, it's, the, what it was possible yesterday or the day before. You know, yesterday or the day before, uh, you know, selling these two assets and, and going you know, long on these, this, this side and going short on the other side uh, would have given you the best answer. But, you know, that might not exist today. It might be a completely, the optimal solution might be in a completely different space. So, so that's kind of the, the folly uh, of uh, heuristics and AI. And I guess the other thing to mention with that is here six and AI require, you know, often quite a lot of, um, lot of data to train the models, you know, which, which a lot of the time the data doesn't exist. So then coming on to then quantum technologies. Now, what do quantum technologies do that's different? Again, imagine this, quantum, this landscape of mountains and valleys and you want to find the deepest point. You know, what you would do is uh, imagine filling it up with water slowly, right? Um, the water will go into, will be drawn into the deepest position, the deepest point in the valley. And as you're filling it up with water, imagine you've got a drone level view or a helicopter's view, and you can start to see where the pools of water are starting to form. Now, that is, that is a view of how quantum, quantum uh, technologies are able to then find uh, optimal solutions to optimization challenges. Um, any, any questions on that? I just, uh, someone was just raising their hand. So, um, uh, the, you can see the question here. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it depends on, yeah. So, uh, so Love Kush is asking market of today depends on market of past, uh, unlike ideal case, how do we deal with it? So, um, the market of today, so depending on what you're looking to optimize, right? Um, so in, in quantum technologies, you don't, you know, the, the training data is a concept that doesn't really exist. So you don't need to train it with the, with the market, you know, with market-like scenarios of the past. Um, it looks at, um, you know, it looks at each situation independently and it finds the best answer in each situation. So um, examples of quantum-inspired algorithms. Um, so quantum inspired algorithms is again, so the, the, the companies that are working on quantum inspired uh, technologies are, are Fujitsu, Microsoft, uh, and, and to an extent Hitachi, Toshiba, right? Um, and they, they are providing solutions to uh, challenges such as portfolio optimization. So portfolio optimization uh, is, is one, of the, one of the areas where quantum, in, quantum inspired algorithms exist. Uh, and you can find the optimal solution in that space. Um, happy to go into more detail if you want. Um, Charlie Beach um, asks, can yeah. you give a concrete example of what you mean by filling the valley with water? Uh, yeah. How can yeah. I intuitively wrap my head around the intuitive side of inner workings here? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so so, so this, the, the idea of this analogy was not to go into the technical, um, you know, the technical details of it. So, uh, so the technical details of how a quantum system, so different quantum systems from quantum inspired through to quantum annealing through to um, quantum mechanics and trap time and so on, um, how they, they fill the valley with water. Um, it's, it's quite complex and different in different, different areas. Now, what we, what we do at Safe Partners, we don't, we don't, um, you know, we, we, what we look at is the possibilities of these different systems and what the potential is of the, these different systems and what they need to be able to work, right? And what, as well as looking at what their limitations are. Um, so that's kind of the perspective that we take. Um, so the, in, in simple words, um, Charlie, you know, the, how it can fill the valley of water is by being able to look at an enormous number of scenarios, an enormous number of mountains and valleys um, all at the same time, right? Uh, which is which is something that's not possible uh, with uh, with these. Um, so Rishi is asking are resources on these algorithms available online. Yes, uh, there are papers um, that are available online, which uh, which I can uh, which I can send you um, the link to. Um, so Rishi, if you connect with me, I can send you some papers around uh, around quantum inspired algorithms, and um, we can happy to chat about why they're super exciting. 
one more thing, uh, Michelle, before we go on. Here, you describe human brute force, uh, ML, and uh, the quantum technology as being separate, but um, I would, my understanding is that quantum technology overlaps uh, over those other. You could apply the human approach with quantum technology and do it much faster. You could apply the, the brute force and you'd get a huge, amount, a huge gain in terms of speed, not so much in terms of uh, efficiency. And you could apply the heuristic ML um, technique or approach with the quantum technology. So yeah. here, do you have a fourth realm where it's neither of those approaches, just quantum technology that is just better? So this is um, so in this example, it's not it's not using quantum technologies. Um, it's not using you know heuristics or AI or any other uh, overlay on top of quantum technology. So this is using pure. You know, this analogy is using pure. Uh, you know, quantum quantum hardware, right? Based on quantum algorithms, such as those developed for portfolio optimization. Now, um, so I, I don't quite uh, agree with you on on um, on the different bits. Of what you said. So, quantum technologies can be used to help speed up, um, you know, quantum machine learning. And quantum machine learning is a field almost on its own. Um, but uh, they're they're independent. Like so, they're they're different from um, you know, the human, uh, a human approach can't be powered by quantum technologies, really. And, and a brute force approach is really, you know, you can think of a brute force, you can think about the quantum, uh, like the quantum inspired or the quantum technologies approach as kind of doing, you know, doing, doing it brute force using, uh, using a jet plane, right? Using a jet plane as a, as, as power behind it rather than a bicycle. So that I think is, is potentially one way to think about, um, you know, how quantum technologies can help with optimization problems. Great. We've got other questions, but I suggest we uh, take them a bit later. What do you think? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, it sounds good. Sounds good. Great. Um, so uh, simulation, again, is, is super important. So um, simulation talks about, um, you know, what, like simulation, again, so Monte Carlo is, um, is, is a very commonly used method for sampling and simulation across many different industries. So that allows you to, to model the complex behavior, the behavior of a complex system, right? Uh, one that can't be described with a parametric function. So, um, but what quantum sampling allows you to do, right? Is uh, it allows you to, to run the simulations on a complex system such that you identify the extremities, right? So you identify uh, the values in, in the previous example or identify the characteristics of the system. Um, and, <laughs> What it allows you to do is it allows you to do this with quadratically less samples than than Monte Carlo, right? So which is <coughs> which is super uh, super interesting uh, because um, because it allows you to do it with um, you know much less samples than than possible with Monte Carlo simulation, um, and and that's that's really exciting because you can get to the behaviors of the system much quicker which is really you know, quite widely applicable. And, and I'll get into um, an example of exactly this when we get into the reverse stress testing um, case. Um, so just in the interest of time, so we've got, we've got similar thinking around you know, machine learning and cryptography, but I think uh, it would be helpful to just come to a, you know, get to a tangible, um, tangible example on, on the reverse stress testing piece. So uh, reverse stress testing, uh, so what is reverse stress testing, right? So it's a key objective. One key objective of this is to overcome what some might call disaster myopia. Um, so a, a possibility that you get a false sense of security that arises from stress testing that, that would exist of today. Um, so, so what is it? So I think many people would have heard of um, traditional stress testing, uh, which is you know, looking at different scenarios, historical or hypothetical, and then applying it to your balance sheet or your portfolio and seeing how you perform as a result of that. So what, what would happen to, to you, your company, your bank, uh, if 2008 were to happen again, uh, or if 2001 were to happen again, or in the future, people will look at what if, you know, uh, Q1, Q2, 2020 were to happen again. Um, and, and seeing whether you, whether you perform well, whether you are able to uh, continue to be viable as a, um, as a business. Now, um, again, the key concept comes back in this case, right? 
um, often the past does not represent the future. So this crisis in 2020 is different from the crisis in, in 2008, which is different from the crisis in 2001 and, and, and so on, right? So past us, at least in the, in the period with which we've been, you know, collecting data about different market movements and collecting data and analyzing data about uh, sophisticated markets and different industries, um, the past does not represent the future. There may be some uh, patterns that may repeat itself, but it, it's, quite, uh, it's quite diverse. Now that's where the concept of reverse stress testing comes in. So it's kind of inverting the thinking in some ways. So in reverse stress testing, uh, what you're required to do is from all the scenarios that are possible, uh, find the ones uh, that, that would lead to an institution reaching a target loss, right? So of all the things that are possible uh, in my portfolio, all the things that are possible in, my, uh, in, my, in, in, in the markets, what are the combination of those movements that would lead me to the target loss, right? So um, in, in finance, we talk about risk factors. So what are the combination of risk factors that will lead to an institution reaching a target loss? Um, now, this is super important because this almost flips it on its head and gives you a much more scientific um, or, or a mathematical certainty that, you know, of all the scenarios that are possible, I am prepared for or the ones that will that will lead me to um, lead me to be inviable and viable as an institution. Um, it, it's a it's a paradigm or it's a it's a regulatory um, regulatory scheme that's that's becoming more and more prominent, and regulators are pushing institutions to do more reverse stress testing, and it's one that's uh, undoubtedly going to grow in the future in terms of more institutions being uh, required to do um, reverse stress testing, and today. Um, the way institutions do reverse stress testing is essentially running a standard stress test um, for multiple times, right? So uh, they, they do not have a um, systematic way of performing reverse stress testing uh, to identify the scenarios that are relevant. Instead, what, what people do is they make a, uh, a bit of a guess as to what they think is a possible scenario. Um, and based on that, uh, they then look at um, based on this guess that we, um, based on these scenarios that we think are possible, um, how will we perform? What, what does the stress look like, right? So there's no kind of mathematical way, systematic way of, of running reverse stress, uh, reverse stress testing today. Um, so how will quantum technologies help with this problem? Um, in, in the short term, um, quantum simulation techniques can be used to reduce the number of scenarios that are assessed by traditional stress tests. So at the moment, you know, you just throw different scenarios into a stress test and then see. Uh, the scenarios that you throw into the stress test are essentially selected at random or selected using Monte Carlo techniques. Now, just remember back to what we were saying in terms of quantum simulation. Using quantum simulation, you'll be able to uh, better identify the characteristics of the system with less samples. So using that, you can then identify already the ones that are more likely uh, to uh, to cause disruption to your bank or to reach you reach the target loss, and those are the ones that are then sent into the full um, stress testing model. And in in the long term, uh, essentially reverse stress testing becomes a combinatorial optimization problem, uh, like the ones that we talked about before. So it's almost reversing uh, reversing what you do in portfolio optimization. So reversing uh, what are the combination of movements that will give me the greatest loss. So of all the things that are possible from this entire landscape, what are the combinations that will give me the greatest loss or the loss beyond the target level? Um, and, and what is the probability of these, these occurring? So um, just going into kind of how the process um, you know, evolves from today. So today you've got a qualitative selection of scenarios and random scenario selection, right? So people choose scenarios at random or, or just pick scenarios based on human judgment. Uh, they run through, you know, the stress testing model. So the pricing engines and things, these often take several hours and sometimes you know, even run overnight. And then from that, you get the distress scenarios, the ones that are identified uh, for analysis and identified as being incomplete. Right. Uh, and, and then those are the ones that, uh, that you then look to address. In the short to medium term, you know, we see um, quantum simulation as a, as a key tool. So quantum simulation used to identify and select what some of those extreme scenarios might be. 
Um, and then rather than running this whole set of scenarios through the engine, you run a, sm a smaller set of scenarios through the engine. And then that comes to um, the subset of, of the ones you need to be looking at. Um, and then in the longer term, um, you know, of course, you treat it as a combinatorial optimization problem. Uh, but this requires, in our view, this requires kind of more maturity in quantum technologies. Important to say, quantum simulation, as we've described there, uh, can actually be done today, right? Like the technologies, there are uh, companies that are able to do quantum simulation in reverse stress testing that can allow you to unlock um, this, this problem today, which is, you know, hugely exciting. Right, a um, couple of quick things before we go into q and I think this is, this is quite important uh, for those that are looking to begin their quantum journey, right? So, um, so as, as we've gone through over the last kind of hour or so, hugely exciting field to be in uh, and hugely important field to be in. You know, what, what are the key things that you need to keep in mind as you begin this journey? Now, first thing that we say is be use case led and, and problem led, right? Do not be technology led with this. You know, understand deeply and innately what is the problem you're looking to solve and then look at how can the technology solve this problem or how can various technologies solve this problem. Do not look at different technologies and, and see, you know, solve problems because you can, right? Because there's no business value in doing this. And the more theoretical experimental problems that uh, get solved without a tangible business impact, the more executive sponsors will start to lose trust and excitement and belief in, in quantum. So it's important to understand that this is a long-term journey. So the, like quantum computing is not a, you know, something that's gonna happen today, tomorrow. Um, it, it's something that will take time. Like true quantum computing will take some time. Although, you know, remind, remembering what we just said before, using quantum inspired techniques, quick wins can be created today. And it's really important to create these quick wins, right? Uh, it's really important to create these quick wins because uh, these, these create business value in the short term. And this is super important in enabling um, executive support um, to exist, right? So quick wins are super important as you create value and it's super important to use those to create value today. And most importantly, right? Most importantly, uh, do, not ignore, do not ignore this trend. <laughs> do not think about quantum computing that's a science fiction thing, that something will happen in 10, 15 years, um, that I don't have to worry about it until it comes back. Like doing that, do that at your peril, right? Do that if you, um, if you are, uh, if you are, by doing that, you'll be undoubtedly missing out on opportunities that exist today and leaving and being left behind by competitors that might come, that might go ahead of you in this journey. And then finally, um, how do you get started? So, um, so we think the first step is really to understand what is the long-term impact here, right? What is possible with quantum technologies in your industry? What value can you unlock? What, you know, how much dollars and cents can you create through solving which problems where, right? And that will help you form a vision of where you want to apply these technologies in your business, how you want your business to be transformed with these technologies. Once you have that vision, you need to develop a roadmap. How are you going to get to that vision? How are you going to get to that organization or that um, industry of the future? Um, and very important through all of this is to develop a business case. Um, again, don't go into quantum because it's cool. Go into quantum because it will create value, right? Don't go into quantum because, you know, it's exciting um, because it's, it's the best technology that exists go into quantum because it will create value. And that value needs to be articulated in a business case. And the business case needs to be visionary for the long term, but really tangible and quantifiable in the short and medium term. Um, it's also super important then to experiment with early stage technologies, right? To show proof points to your organization that all of this is not, you know, smoke and mirrors, all of this is not science fiction, but there's some real, uh, the real tangible proof and real tangible value that you can create. And it's really important to periodically refine this business case. So as you start to create this value, as you start to you know, re invest more and more and realize the investment, it's, it's important to start to um, refine the business case as you get along. Great, thank you very much for listening. Um, that was the presentation that we had for today. Um, there are a few questions that have been popping up, so happy to go through those. And as I said before, happy to um, connect with anyone and have conversations.
um, to to, um, to to go into the, to con go through concepts in more detail. Thank you, Vishal. Uh, we'll go through the questions. Um, before that, I wanted to uh, to say thank you very much for the presentation. I like how at the end you very really delved into what it's like to to build uh, something new with this technology. You gave really uh, useful and actionable tips uh, for any startup. I, I recognize uh, the, the lean startup model here where we, we wanna have quick wins, we wanna bring value to the table uh, efficiently. So I thought this was uh, very hands-on and I appreciate that the, the business problem that here we've got a great technology which is uh, quantum computing, but what is the business application focus on that um thank you for this no worries there's, uh, pleasure yeah there's one question that kunal uh had uh, well it's, it's a comment and um and it kind of ties in with something that you've uh, you've been saying uh, throughout the presentation that um it's not only the, the computer game the computational gains that we'll uh, benefit from uh, with quantum computing but it's also the the fact that sampling is being done totally differently. Um, and it seems like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this is specifically useful for combinatorial problems where uh, there is a factorial uh, a number of possibilities. And those are the, it's, we're not talking about exponential, factorial. And that's where uh, quantum computing can uh, play a big role. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, yeah. So, I think there's there's combinatorial problems, combinatorial optimization problems are are the ones that um, I think are are the closest uh, to um, you know to being exploited at scale to be realized at scale, right? Like so. Um, again, some of these problems can be solved using quantum inspired techniques, uh, which is which is very exciting. Very well, and um, the. Uh... The fact that uh, earlier on you were talking about the uh, the scenarios, the, the fact that you can do the reverse stress test and evaluate a worst case scenario, or not not evaluate, identify. Yeah. Um, and I, I was wondering here you will have a, a variety, uh, like a plethora of parameters. So will this algorithm fetch a parameter range, or will it identify a parametric signature for which this is the worst case scenario. And then you have to further find to which range of parameters this applies. So it will, um, so interesting question, right? Like, so it won't, it, it won't fetch um, a range of parameters. So what, what uh, the solution does, it'll, it'll give you a range of inputs. So inputs being market movements uh, for which you will be able to get to um, outputs, which is outputs being um, being the target loss, right? So for what range of inputs across what combination of inputs uh, will give you the output that you're looking at? Um, it, does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. But then in this case, we'll have only those specific uh, inputs that we have considered as opposed to, let's say, a bracket oh. of uh, market movement where we say, oh, this is problematic, like a subset here. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so it, it, the inputs you, by inputs, I mean like, so of all the market movements that are possible that are relevant to you and your portfolio and your balance sheet, what are the combination of those uh, that will create, uh, create the output? So the, out, the output really will be, here's a combination of those market movements. So each combination of those market movements can be thought of as a scenario for a stress test, right? Um, right. So one stress test would be, you know, you, you've got say 10,000 risk factors, right? Each risk factor is like, can't think of it like an asset, I guess. Um, but if you've got for, for those 10,000 risk factors, but what is each of those? What is, so what is the combination of X moving, you know, 2% and, and Y moving 3% and so on. Um, so each, each combination of those becomes a, uh, becomes a scenario to then be, uh, to then be, be addressed. Um, there's a, there's a few questions. Um, there's a few questions that, uh, that, um, yeah, that have come through. So Kunal, um, I, I can, um, I can send you some of the stuff around the machine learning, uh, machine learning slides and things. If you get in touch with me, 
uh, I can I can share that with you. Um, yeah, I, I, I specifically, think specifically, uh, Kunal was asking about the 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 water analogy and uh, if it was due to interference with uh, wave functions. So you'll get back to him uh, on this. Yeah, yeah, I can get back to him on that one as well. Yeah. Winger Winger uh, has asked the question, at how many qubit is uh, optimization better in uh, quantum computing than their classical counterparts? Mm, Maybe there are some research papers uh, that, you, uh, that you know of yeah, yeah. to recommend. Yeah, it's interesting because um, I don't think you can think of, uh, think of qubits in isolation. So um, I think while qubits are important, you know, having more qubits doesn't necessarily equate to a better solution or a bigger problem um, that because because of the you know because of error correction that might exist so some might have better error correction than others and because of the entanglement um, between the qubits that might exist so it's not a straightforward answer to look at how many qubits uh, you start to you start to um, you start to develop greater uh, propensity over classical computing um, I think a better way to think about it is in quantum volume. So quantum volume is a metric that is a combination of those three things that I talked about. Um, and quantum volume is, is what starts to become interesting, right? Um, and uh, some might have seen Honeywell um, published a paper um, just a couple of weeks ago about um, having reached quantum volume of 64. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, and that starts to, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't quite beat the best in class classical yet, but it starts to set the uh, tone towards that. And that, that in terms of quantum volume, that's the best quantum volume that, that exists for today. Um, um, yeah, you wanna go on? No, no, I was, I was just gonna read through some of the questions on that. Uh, Absolutely. Um, on, yeah. Um, so there's a question around real use cases of NISC quantum in financial markets uh, banking. You know, if you want to start um, real life use cases, um, where should you start? So um, again, there's a there's a paper around quantum and financial services. There's some some applications of NISC, but to be honest, you know, in terms of real life uh, use cases of NISC, there's not that many um, because NISC isn't um, isn't you know able to solve problem uh, problems at at production level scale. Again, repeating my point from earlier, quantum inspired algorithms is a new new paradigm, which is super interesting because um, it can allow you to to address some of those. Um, and there are papers around that around quantum inspired algorithms from uh, guys like you know uh, Fujitsu, Microsoft, um, Bait, and so on. Um, there's a question about um, don't have quantum computers yet, something far out from it. They're proven results for of useful problems solved on current devices. Okay. Uh, what should make us optimistic that large scale quantum computers will become available in the future? So, um, so answering your last question first, uh, what will make us optimistic that large scale quantum computers uh, will uh, be, be available in the future? is the, the rate with which um, you know, we're progressing today. So the, the Honeywell, um, you know, as I was talking about, quantum volume 64 is, is, is quite impressive. It's ahead of anything else that, that exists in the industry. Um, and we're moving, you know, there's a lot of money, uh, there's a lot of investment, and there's a lot of progress being made. Although, you no, know, you're right, they're, they're still, um, they're, they're still from two state quantum computing, we're still a few years away. Uh, but, um, you know, the proven results on, on quantum inspired algorithms and quantum inspired approaches. So for optimization algorithms and optimization uh, challenges like we were talking about before, uh, quantum inspired techniques can be up to 10,000 times faster than, than the best classical uh, approaches, which is, which is super exciting. Um, so are you aware of uh, companies such as IBM Rigetti that are use quantum error correction in the stack? So every, every, um, winger, winger, every, everyone has to use quant error correction in the stack. So um, error correction is, is part of um, the system itself. So um, as far as I understand, all the, all the major players do it. Um, JP Morgan uh, has partnered with Honeywell to utilize quantum computers financial services. They've also partnered with Microsoft on some quantum projects. Um, 
at this stage, the efforts are in their infancy, but it's, uh, is it this significant that businesses are trying to step on uh, to ramp up? Yeah, absolutely. It's significant that, you know, you can see JP Morgan investing quite a lot. Um, some of the big hedge funds have also invested quite a lot recently in these areas. Uh, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's quite heartening to see that um, you know, big institutions are investing, taking this seriously and moving forward with it. Um, how costly is it to have someone um, develop a quantum computing circuit slash program? <laughs> Interesting question. Um, quantum computing circuits or well, quantum computing programs, it varies, it varies a lot, right? Like, so um, it can be like the proof of concepts that exist based on, uh, you know, problems or areas where people have looked at. Um, they they look at um, you know so so if it's in areas where people have already paid some attention to, then it's uh, then it doesn't cost as much. But you know, developing a full stage something new in a new area can be can be quite expensive, can go into the millions. Um, but but you know just just uh, on the cost point, I think there are you know m many uh, quantum computing companies out there um, that can allow you to do some experimentation. Uh, for for not very much, so for you know, um, much less than like a hundred thousand range, two hundred thousand range, um, you can you can do some experimentation, some proof of concepts, which are important uh, to then allow you to then invest the, uh, the you know the millions to uh, develop the business case to allow to to invest the millions. Um, Kunala, yeah, about the machine learning stuff, we'll um, just get in touch with me. I'll I'll, I'll share those with you. Happy to do that. Uh, what is your take on papers which dis disproves efficacy of QC? Uh, like Conan, Conan Sarkask. Uh, enough before jumping ship to quantum algorithms. Um, interesting, interesting point, right? Like interesting point, Winga Winga. Um, yes, <laughs> I think there's there's uh, there's a lot of um, potential still, like at the top of the stack. Uh, with classical computing, um, you know, there's still possibilities there. But you know, my my opinion is that um, yeah, while it's possible, I think you know a lot of people talk about software eating the world. It's possible. Uh, software will, it will continue to make lots of progress. Uh, but you know, quantum computing hardware, in my opinion at least, is is such a big paradigm shift. It's uh, it's a completely new way of looking at things. So. Um, so I think we need to look at both. I, I, think, I don't think we choose one over the other. Thank you, Shell, for taking the time to go all through all these questions. Um, this has been a great session. Um, I understand that uh, you've made yourself available for some questions. Uh, will your uh, contact information be available? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, feel free to, I can, um, if I, Remy, if I say if I send some stuff through on the chat, will that come through on? Uh, will that be sent to everyone? I think I can send it to. Yeah, you can. You can do that. To the panelists and attendees. Yeah. So. I would like to uh, remind everybody who uh, took part today that this uh, session was recorded. It's available on YouTube on our channel. Uh, you can have access to all our. Um, social activity through our website uh, associationquantum.org uh, you'll find our link to uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. This uh, um, for, to know about a future event you can also go on the website. Uh, next uh, in two weeks there's going to be an event. Vishal would you like to uh, mention it? That's right so we'll be doing a SEA Partners event uh, in collaboration with the guys at Association Quantum so uh, where we'll be talking um, about applications across industries. Um, and so we'll have the guys from Association Quantum on board, but we'll also have um, the major quantum computing players on board. So we'll have um, Fujitsu, Rigetti, um, um, and Bait and, and others as well. So um, it'll be quite an exciting session, I think, um, to go through, uh, to go through, you know, a view of all the value that can be generated in this field. That's wonderful. So if you want to have more information about this, where can we find it? So we'll be releasing, um, we'll be releasing information about that through, um, through the Association Quantum 
uh, LinkedIn um, channel, um, and we'll be we'll be releasing information about that in in, um, in our LinkedIn channel as well. So follow um, follow me on LinkedIn, um, and you'll you'll no doubt see information about that. I'm sure. Great, um, and, and as you said. We, we will put this on a association quantum as well. Uh, there will be the other uh, uh, webinars that are is due for uh, in a month, two weeks after that event appears. And uh, to see uh, the other events uh, planned throughout the summer, just go to our website. With this conclude uh, concludes our webinar. Do you, would you like to add anything, Vishal, before we wrap up? Um, no, thank you, Remy, um, and thank you to the guys at Association Quantum for, for having me. It's been a real pleasure to have an engaging discussion with, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the participants today. And yeah, look forward to being in touch with many of you. And um, yeah, look forward to speaking soon. Thank you, Michelle. All right, thank you.